All right. <clears throat> okay, again, my name is Tokiko Bazel. And I'd like to start with the things you learned yesterday's workshops are very important core uh, functions. And uh, those things are everyone, like including myself, is supposed to perform well. Okay. So uh, I'd like to actually talk about something going beyond the day day-to-day uh, -day expectations to do the unexpected and to do something creative uh, to fill unmet needs. So perhaps, you know, some of your uh, donor comes in and brings a document. You know, nobody tells you what to do with it, but you can actually think of something, you know, you wanted to make out of it. Okay. So special initi initiatives will not have a textbook to guide you how to start or procedures along the way. And to be successful, it requires us librarians to be a little bit ambitious and fearless. And sometimes it takes, most of the time, you have to take a leadership role and show persistence. So special initiatives will allow you develop new skills that might be outside your comfort zones, such as detective skills, communication skills, networking, salesmanship, administrative skills, and multitasking skills. However, successful special projects will help you distinguish yourself professionally, and they can bring, they can bring recognition to your home institution and create local and international collaborations. And maybe you can create new access to uh, materials, otherwise, you know, stash away and nobody knew. And also, this is very important, you get personal satisfaction. <laughs> and you might leave a legacy behind you. Okay, so uh, I'd like to challenge you, each of you, to take on one such initiative during your career. And it's kind of fun, it's hard, but it's fun. Okay, so case study one is my challenge. Restoration of three historical Japanese scrolls. There you go. So, let's say all these uh, scrolls are restored nicely. Then what? <laughs> and then they said, uh, well, you know, just come to think about it. Those scrolls were already stashed, stashed away for several years. Nobody knew their existence, right? So once the scrolls are restored, are they going to be stashed away again? You know, right? They said. So they thanked me for sharing my ideas, and then at the end they said, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I learned a valuable lesson. <laughs> okay, so those are the scrolls. So my mistake, first mistake that I did not think, you know, mistake was I did not think through what I wanted to accomplish and how it would be benefit the research community and uh, motivate donors. So librarian, librarians as project managers, we first have to objectively assess our own knowledge and skill sets. And I also decided not to take all three projects together, but divide it up to tackle with the easiest, looking like easiest one first. So I took the first scroll, which is a much shorter scroll, and then price is not that as much as, you know, other scroll restorations. So I wanted to kind of give a shot. Uh, okay. So in hindsight, this uh, dividing up the project into small pieces actually became very beneficial. Um, because I could build up my experience to take on, you know, first, then second, and the third. 
And uh, each time I actually created the momentum, you know, sustain the momentum, and then get people excited, each one. So uh, at the end, my uh, director said, uh, you know, that was a brilliant idea, actually divided up into uh, three pieces, you know, over the years. Because each time you did something, more people coming in, more people getting excited. It's more like a tsunami, Tokiko. You created a tsunami. <laughs> so, yeah, it was a good idea. <laughs> All right. So, this is my self-assessment. So what do I know about these scrolls? Minimum. So I had to do, uh, you know, start immediately researching the background information, you know, related to this scroll. So that's why I call it detective work, which is kind of fun. How did the collections come to our institution? Who were involved in acquisitions? Who are primary users? Who would be potential users? And I examined so many historical documents and literatures, newspapers and articles, talking to the faculty, and so on. What do I know about restoration of scrolls? Nothing. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I had never, you know, taken on this kind of project. So I had no idea what it involves. So I learned about restoration and preservation issues. I took class, preservation class at the UH uh, Library and Science, and read a lot of literatures. Also, I visited other institutions in US and Japan. Those are the institutions I visited. Quite a few, you can tell. And uh, those visiting those institutions, not only I can see the first hand examples, at the same time, I can build up the network of people, experts. This is one uh, picture when I visited Harvard, a uh, preservationist there. And they just found 200 scrolls in the basement of the Harvard <laughs> University. And they started you know, kind of preserving those scrolls. So it was kind of nice experience, good timing. Okay, networking. Investigating the background of the collections and visiting various institutions allowed me to meet many experts and expanded my technical support network and helped establish new relationships. And it also gave me more information to help persuade our administra administrators within the library and the center on the merits of the project. I got all kind of lingos and good, you know, terms and stuff both from those people. This is critical because project success truly depends on gaining and then maintaining that momentum. This is much easier if we have a strong inside institutional support. So within the library, for my case, is I have to, of course, network with our university librarian, development officer, physical officer, and those people. And we do have a good preservation department, so I have to get full support from them. And on campus, all those faculty groups, and we had a Center for Okinawan Studies. This actually a scroll belonged to Okinawan Studies, actually Okinawan collections, so that is a good thing. People who are involved in the initial purchase, management, president's office, physical you know, uh, officer, and the UH Foundation. Locally, I have to uh, reach out local donors, and then Okinawan community. Uh, we have a huge Okinawan immigrant community in Hawaii, so I have to kind of network with them, or local news media, and of course, Consulate General of Japan. They have some money to help you. <laughs> and then US mainland, I reach out donors to the University of Hawaii. In Japan, mainland Hawaii, in Japan is the scholars, researchers, librarians, and conservators, and this one especially kind of got related to uh, Ryukyu Okinawa, so I established a relationship with the archivists there, curators, U.S. Consulate General is Naha, news media, and so forth. Collaborations. Okay, networking and establishing new relationships always lead to new collaborative opportunities. My case is I met a scholar who worked at the Tokyo National Museum. 
That scholar actually connected me to the Tokyo National Museum's conservator. And the conservator said, all right, I can do it for you. Kind of like that. <laughs> so I said, wow, great. So uh, that actually is a really turned out to be very good because the fact that Tokyo National Museum's conservator was willing to help us actually shows, provided sort of uh, official kind of like approval seal to our institution. So uh, our administrator said, wow, that's great. So this is Mr. Kaneda. He took on the first scroll. The second big collaborative opportunity came from a scholar whom I befriended when I was doing a research background research. He recommended that the second scroll, 1710 procession scroll, be added to the National Museum of Japanese Histories. They are at that time building the new wing, so they are looking for something, the permanent, you know, exhibit item. So he recommended our scroll. So they contacted me and they wanted to get the permission to create a replica of our scroll. So with this scholar's help, I negotiated with them and said, sure, but before <laughs> you actually make a replica, you need to restore the scroll. <laughs> <laughs> and then I put it through into a digitization in it and then, uh, you know, replica with the matching fund. <laughs> so it was really nice, you know, $30,000 is kind of difficult to raise for me, but uh, 15000 is a little bit better. Okay. And then uh, I can also tie it into this type of opportunity to another potentials. By this time, the UH was going to create the Center for Okinawan Studies, so they are working so hard to do that, to get the legislature's approval. So I used this opportunity to create the lecture and the reception series right after the completion. I invited two scholars from the Tokyo National Museum, Tokyo, no, the National Museum of the Japanese History to give us a lecture, and then he throw out a huge reception invited legislators, <laughs> UH uh, officials, and the library officials, centers, and faculty, and all those people. And now, uh, of course, Consulate General of uh, Honolulu, Japan, Honolulu. So those, uh, this kind of opportunity actually reach out our donors, and then kind of like, you know, uh, authorized what we are doing is great for the community. And uh, that truly helped to establish the Center for Okinawan Studies. Okay, third scroll, now this one. After the two uh, phases of the restoration project were very successful in the mainland Japan, my, actually, uh, I envisioned that the third scroll should be restored in Okinawa. So I tried to sell that way, that idea, okay? Now, the last one, we've got to do it in Okinawa. So using the network developed in Hawaii and Okinawa, I negotiated with the Okinawa Prefectural Museum and uh, to restore the, and uh, digitize again the third scroll. They liked the idea. I then launched a fundraising campaign in Hawaii, focusing this time in, on donors in the local Okinawa community. And my efforts resulted in a grant from the local Okinawa cultural program and a donations from individuals in Hawaii as well as in Okinawa. You know, people got really excited about this. Again, I can tie this, tie in uh, this one with another potential. The restoration of this uh, scroll, the third one, would have significant to people in Okinawa as well as, as in Hawaii. So I wanted to tie this one uh, with the opportunity uh, of our University of Hawaii president's first visit to Okinawa. So I, we agreed to exhibit this scroll at the Okinawa Prefectural Museum during our president's visit. And I held a ceremony for the president and the muse, museum officials, which turned out to be really good. This is actually a second, third scroll uh, conservator. So it was picked up by a local media. You know, it was a quite big, uh, big thing. <laughs> 
And this is a Ryukyu Shinpo's. Uh, it was really kind of, uh, everybody got really excited about this. All right. So budgeting. I learned quickly after carrying out the first scroll project that the restriction cost itself was just the beginning. <laughs> In other words, it is just the minimum. So $60,000 is just minimum. <laughs> and there are a lot of more costs that needed to be considered. You know, I just kind of started learning along the way. Now, things you have to think about is, of course, restriction costs. But within a restriction cost, you always have to think about yen and dollar exchange rate. You know, when we agree upon how, how much in yen, usually, because they actually gave us a proposal, and then they write it off. And then I propose, OK, how much, how much in dollar? But by the time the scroll was completed, and when we had to pay, yen became so high, <laughs> and it's a huge difference, because it was a pretty expensive project. So uh, end cost is much more than I thought, and I had to really do a fundraising a lot. And I learned about conservator and a collaborator. Most of the museums in Japan have conservators, but some museums have in-house their employee as a conservator. But most of them have a contractor outside because there are so many conservators around. So what they do is they actually contract it out. So you really have to think about what, you know, what kind of relationship between them and work around it. I didn't know this one either. And how to carry around, carry the scroll and coming back and all those transportation costs. And this is really insurance policy. <laughs> This one is kind of hard, too. I didn't know anything about insurance, so I had to really consult with uh, our fiscal officer. And does it include the conservator side again? That if the conservator is outside contractor, you know, they, their studio is outside as well. So, uh, you know, how much we have to put it into? Is that included or what? And you really have to find out those things. And I learned it the hard way. Okay, then you have to find out estimated cost of value of the object. This is really hard. You have to actually get it uh, an appraisal and uh, find it out who will do a uh, you know, great appraisal. And appraisal money is kind of, it's not that cheap. <laughs> so you have to think about the cost of appraisal as well. Okay, grants. With the uh, institution's development officer, you always have to work with them. I began investigating grant assistance, and I learned that the restriction is not sexy to most grant providers. You know, when I said it's restriction, they go, ah, you know, ah, like this. So um, I managed donations by fundraising and libraries matching fund for the first scroll. So I didn't have to do much of the grant writing, the first one. But from the second project, I added in much more appealing aspects such as digitization or improved access or perpetuation of cultural heritage to our next generations. That kind of, you know, thing, so that you really have to incorporate those wordings. Also, uh, partnering and collaboration beyond my host institution became a very important <coughs> element for successful grants and fundraising. So I always go for uh, intramural grants first, which was quite successful. Everybody was so excited about it, and the local grants as well, too. And U.S. grants might be those items, National Endowment of Humanities, but you really need to work with your development officer and you, you know, the foundation if you have, because maybe conflicting grants are already awarded to UH, so you have to work with them. Japan's grants are those Agency of Cultural Affairs, Nippon Foundation, Toshiba Foundation, Japan, World Exposition, and stuff. However, uh, this is really tricky. They are willing to give the grants to the museums if museums want to restore st scrolls. But we are, you know, uh, libraries. 
So at that time, the grant application in written such a way that completely divided the libraries and uh, museums grants. So if you get the books and so forth, they are willing to fund. But uh, if I say the scroll restoration, they think that is museum's job. So that was a little bit hard. So this time I gave up <laughs> to get some money from Japan's uh, grant agencies. Fundraising. OK, successful fundraising is closely tied to outreach efforts. In addition to personally talking to established donors, I made eight presentations, public presentations, wrote 10 articles to newspapers and newsletters, and invited over 100 people to share the excitement at receptions. So those are the uh, venues I used a lot, you know, repeatedly. Right? I did a lot of receptions. Because when they see actual restored scrolls, you know, they get excited. They, they, they really feel, you know, close to us. So that was a really good way to reach out people. Documentations. I told you there was no textbook to guide you. So this actually documentation is, you know, I learned hard way. Each time I did something, somebody said something, and every time, you know, I really need to work on it. Okay, so documentation detail is that the most important stuff is, uh, you know, memorandum of understanding between our institution and the collaborator. So this is time consuming and energy consuming. Okay. And uh, there are quite a few kind of weird document, you know, uh, documentation that I have to go through too. This is a letter of proxy. We actually use uh, somebody to carry the scroll back and forth, so we have to actually give this kind of uh, proxy letters. And uh, U.S. customers actually require a certain certificate of origin and stuff like that. I, ne I never knew. And also certificate antique. Those, you know, uh, papers. And this is a MOU example. So, uh, you have a handout in your uh, in your book booklet. So these things you need to kind of think about it. So our MOU is like this, you know. And at the end, we I I only have to get the university librarian's signature, but also uh, director of the financial management and controller University of Hawaii because University of Hawaii is a state institution. So I have to actually jump over so many bureaucratic hooplas to, to get approved. And insurance check again. These things are important. And outreach efforts. All right. I told you I did so many presentation articles and stuff, of course. And then I developed a website as well, like this Okinawa Collection website in it. I put it some of the digital images of those scrolls. So people, actually, we have a, big, a lot of kids. And I wanted to show you the timeline to give you, a, you know, some kind of overall uh, project of first scroll. I picked this one because this one is the shortest, smallest, and the cheapest kind of restoration. But it was hard because this was my first attempt, right? So uh, it took me more energy and more time to complete the first one. But I tell you, once you did it, you know, second and third are getting easier and easier. So this is the overall timeline of the first scroll project. First, my appointment is June 1999, and I decided to get assessment from the local conservator, and then blah, and the new university librarian came here and assessed another assessment, and this. So from 1999 through November 2003, that's for the first scroll. <laughs> okay, so this is my uh, visits to uh, different institutions in Japan and uh, US. It's good to just spread out like this because you learned once from one institution and uh, build up the sum in you know, knowledge and then go into the next. 
And this is an outreach effort. I did some uh, coordination. With, I coordinated the lecture series, and I made myself a presentation, wrote articles and receptions, and, uh, and I curated an exhibit as well in, on campus. So funding started coming in like this way, little bit of trickle down, <laughs> so little by little. So the first scroll, we made a deal with the uh, university librarian. Whatever I raised, she's going to you know, pay the rest of the balance. That's why she made me a good deal. So I tried to do that. So those funding started coming in. So she was quite impressed that you know, I can do it. So she, at the end, she gave me a balance. So I'm going to show you uh, this uh, fund, fund money coming in and my outreach efforts. They are truly closely uh, correlated. So if I in superimpose this one into uh, outreach, just like this, so you can see the money coming in each time I did some presentation or lecture series and so forth. So now I'm going to put all those uh, slides into uh, one timeline. Now you can see I described each uh, aspect of a linear chrono chronology. However, when you, you can see it, each element on this linear timeline has its own three-dimensional depth. You, know? you can see it not called intertwined. OK, I, was, I, was, I want to go back to the original. Did I develop these skills? I think I said yes. <laughs> you know, over the years, I think I did. Um, so, ah, okay. And my original goal of restoring the scrolls expanded truly beyond my expectations. You know, I gained all those skills as well as much more from it. And I want to uh, point out one more important aspect of this project. I want to uh, share one episode. In 2010, okay, a local Okinawan community family uh, donated their family lineage document to the library because they heard about our scroll uh, restoration projects. This directly led to another, actually, project. This one is Okinawan family presented this, their family document. Okay. So I uh, negotiated with the uh, Okinawa Prefectural Museum again to restore this lineage, lineage document. It turned out uh, it turned out the document is a long lost rare family lineage manuscript, and their ancestor was one of the members of the 1710 procession to Edo, illustrated in our restored scroll. So this one is the family document. And actually, this is the guy. <laughs> he, he is the one, you know, scroll in their ancestor. So the restored document and this new discovery were shared with many people when the document was exhibited at the uh, Okinawa Prefectural Museum last October. Also, we held the first international symposium. Uh, this is really picked up, the media picked up. Really, they really liked it. And then we did the first International Ancestry Symposium during the exhibit in Okinawa. Lastly, <laughs> another project coming up, a National Museum of Japanese History and the Library are again partnering to exhibit the restored 1671, the third scroll, along with their woodbook prints, this uh, four. This one is they're planning to. So in conjunction with this exhibit, we are planning to offer a symposium next uh, spring. I am kind of working on uh, fundraising and getting grants to invite two scholars from the museum. And I'm going to kind of create a panel discussion to our community. OK, that's it. Thank you.